In our house, we call it D-Day. It was the day everything changed. And, and you know, I've made, a, I've, I've gone public a lot about my pornography addiction. And then there's a lot of people who, who say you could never really be addicted to pornography or whatever. And, and it's always been said that, but all I knew is I couldn't stop. That's all I knew. For me, it was a numbing device. It was something that I went to when I was sad, when I was happy. And I always went back to it and it left me unfulfilled. And I had to get to get more to, to get a feeling of fulfillment, but then I would be left empty again. So it just, it was a cycle. I couldn't stop, but it was also a secret that I held from my family and my wife and the whole thing. And my wife finally confronted me on it. And let me tell you what was, what was so wild and, and really, really strange is that I was, the question I was asking was, why doesn't she believe me? But the question I should have been asking was, why did I lie? Hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. think about that. There's two, the same, it's, it's all in the context, it's the same. And I'm sitting here lying and wondering why she won't believe me. Hmm. It's all out focused. It was all her. It was the responsibility was on her in order to, to make me right. Like, you should believe me because I'm telling you this. But I was lying. I was lying. I don't, I, I don't do this. No, I got no problem. I, I don't do any of this. And, and, and why doesn't she believe me? But once it, it switched into why am I lying? All of a sudden, it went inward. All of a sudden, I had to ask myself the questions I had been avoiding for years and years and years. And it was like, hey, man, you have an issue. Why aren't you doing something about it? And, and like I said, and I would pull out that card of excuses and this, and I would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a man and, you know, men, we need to, we, I have a high sex drive and this kind of stuff. And I'll pull out that card. And then my wife declined it. <laughs> <laughs> that credit card was done. It was expired. And she was out. And you know what, Tim, what's so crazy is that I was like, fine. Bye. Leave. You know, I'm Terry Crews. I can get any woman I want. In fact, I will. And you know what? This is a normal thing in Hollywood. Divorce is, is pretty normal and it's not a big deal. In fact, my career won't suffer. And nobody cares if I lose my family. Hollywood certainly doesn't. And, you, and then I listen to myself talking like that. And I went, who are you? Like, I didn't like that guy. And I started to have internal conversations with myself. And I was like, man, this is not who you say you are. And I realized I was two different people. And when you have a double life, when you, you and, and when I say a double life, what I mean is I was more concerned with the image. I was more concerned with the image of Terry Crews rather than who Terry Crews really was. And, uh, and it was two different people. And once I started to try to put them together, my world crumbled. Everything that I knew, everything that I, I was around, everything that I thought I stood for, I thought I was like, yeah, you know, women are equal and the whole thing. But Nothing in my behavior would, would, would do that or even said that. And in fact, I thought I was more valuable than all the women in my life simply because I was a man, simply because of the culture. I was in, I grew up in black culture and hip hop culture and sports culture. And there was a lot of misogyny. It was a lot of, you're the man, dog. Hey, man, you better get your girl in line. You know, that, that kind of, these kind of words, these kind of, and it wasn't looked at, it was looked at as like, yo, man, you know, you control your wife or your girl. You actually owned her. I remember in the NFL going to the strip club and we'd be 
in the club and with all the guys and the whole thing and the girls be up on stage and one of them would come down and actually want to talk to the players and I would look at her like okay you know she start talking you know I got you know, I got to do this for my kids and then and you're like stop 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 you're like you're ruining the experience because you're becoming a human being right before my eyes I like you to be a picture. I want you to be a doll, a, a mannequin. I mean, Tim, once you start, I, I mean, once you open that can of worms, it's literally like a domino effect. Like everything started to fall on itself. And I said, I, I went through a huge, huge just, and then and now I got to say this because in my culture, when I grew up, you know, therapy was looked at as ridiculous. And because they, I, where I grew up, it was like, you can't cure crazy. That was the term. <laughs> and it was like, if you're crazy, you can't cure it. I, my father being an alcoholic, he went to a psychologist one time. And, uh, and I remember I was probably around 12, 13 years old. And I'm like, wow, I think, you know, my, my dad's finally going to get some help. And, the whole thing. And, uh, dude, it was crazy because, uh, uh, like a week later, the psychologist killed himself. It was on the front page of the newspaper. Oh my God. And I went, that don't work. You know, my, my whole mindset was like, huh? Like, did my father kill him? Like, you know, did he, did he say something that made this guy jump off a bridge? And he got literally jumped off a bridge. And I was wow. like, what? That doesn't work. And so I had in my mind that you know, all this therapy stuff is mumbo jumbo, you know? And so there was a, there was a block, there was a resistance to that. And I, I finally saw a counselor who said, you need to go to this place and get some therapy. And I was like, oh no, you know? And I remember, and, and, and my wife said, look, you know what? If you don't do this, like there's no hope of us ever coming back together because we had split up at that time. And so I went and I said, all right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I'm sitting in, in this room with these people. And Terry, may I interject for one second? Oh, yeah, go ahead. One question. So did, did you guys sort of split at that point or were things on ice because of how you handled the situation, D-Day and that conversation? Or was it the subject matter, like the addiction itself and other things? I guess I'm asking, was it what you did or was it how you handled what you did or something else? It was what I did because what happened was I confessed to a infidelity that happened 10 years earlier as a result of this addiction. Because, you got know, I, I, I went to a massage parlor and got a hand job and I vowed I would never, ever tell anybody. You know, it was one of the things, but I was, it was at the beginning of my career. I was, I was in Vancouver. I was by myself. I thought, I would never be there. I thought I'd never do something like that. But, you know, it was wild because I, I found myself in those circumstances and I did it, but I vowed I would never tell. I was like, I'm taking this secret to the grave, man. This is never, ever coming out. But my wife constantly, she was like, no, you did something. She said, you're something you're not telling me. Yeah, she knew. And again, like I said, I was lying the whole time, you know, and she could feel that, you know I mean? You could feel when your significant other is not telling you the truth. And it was just, there was something she didn't know. And when I told her, I remember just, it, it came out and I remember she's just going, that's it. Like, wow, who am I living with? Like she had no idea. And that was the thing because I was, I had, put an image in front of her. And, I, and then what was so crazy is that she was married to this image. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to her. There's no honesty in the relationship because you have to cover a lie with another lie. And then it just keeps continuing to grow. I mean, we were, we were getting farther and farther apart is what was happening. And she was, she knew it, she felt it. And that was the D-Day moment. And she said, I'm out. She's like, that's it. You can't come home. And if you have to show me that you want this, that you want, actually want to do something. And I, like I said, in the beginning, I was like, I, I'm fine. 
And then I realized, I was like, you know what? Because the whole thing was, it was about her. And it's little bitty questions. It was just like, man, you know, maybe it's me. And the realization that hit me that it was me, that it was. 